All right. So welcome everybody to the Energy is Everywhere webinar series hosted by SEEDS Initiative on our three federal partners, which is the Housing and Urban Development, the Department of Energy, and the Department of Education. The series is focused on engaging low-income and public housing communities across the U.S. on SEED's three pillars, which is energy literacy, STEM, and job-driven skills training. This monthly webinar series is held on the third Thursday of every month at 3 p.m. Eastern. For recordings of this webinar, as well as ones past, please check out our YouTube channel everywhere. So thanks for joining us, and now I'm going to turn this over to my colleague Heidi at the Department of Education, who will introduce today's speakers and the presentation topic. Heidi? Thanks, Miranda. Uh, this is Heidi silver Paquilla. I am at the Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education, uh, and we're pleased to be part of the Energy is Everywhere webinar series, and especially pleased to introduce today's topic. Uh, thank you for filling out the poll. It's always good to see uh, that we have a cross-section of um, attendees because these topics cut across so many parts of our lives. Um, as we go along, I just wanted to let you know that we will be taking uh, questions in the chat box. So there's a chat box on the right side of your screen. Type it in there and we will get to the questions after the guest uh, presenters. Today we're talking about leveraging lifelong learning opportunities in STEM in the public libraries. And we're going to be celebrating and exploring the important role that public libraries play in our communities as sites of and motivators of lifelong learning. Uh, we want to welcome our guest speakers. They are some standout public librarians who are really pushing the boundaries and making a difference in their communities. And we hope you'll be inspired. Uh, and get some ideas about how to work with uh, libraries in your communities, or if you already are, which we hope you are, how to work more closely or add different programming to your communities. Um, they're here to share with us some very creative things that are going on in their communities. So I'm going to pass it off to Tim uh, Kerrigan, my partner at uh, Institute for Museum and Library Services, a federal agency. So Tim, it's up to you to introduce your public librarians. Great. Thank you so much, Heidi. And thanks to Department of Energy and HUD and Education for having us here on the panel today. We're all really excited to be here. Um, we can advance to the next slide, please. Um, as Heidi said, my name is Tim Kerrigan. I am a senior program officer at the Institute for Museum and Library Services. And I am thrilled to be joined by two terrific uh, co-presenters this afternoon from the Cuyahoga County Library, uh, Library in Ohio, Rebecca Ranallo, and Chris Caputo at the Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, and uh, what we hope to do today, uh, next slide, I think I'm, I'm, I'm one ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's us. And uh, next slide, our agenda for today is uh, to talk about, in a broad sense, how uh, libraries can support lifelong learning in the communities across the country, um, partially through the lens uh, of the work of my agency, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, or IMLS for short. And then we're going to do some community close-ups on the great work happening at the Free Library of Philadelphia and Cuyahoga County to give you a taste of the sorts of programs um, and services that libraries are offering today and to hopefully uh, inspire you to consider how um, your organizations can uh, perhaps partner uh, with, with libraries to, uh, to provide lifelong learning opportunities for your residents. And, uh, and if you're already partnering with libraries, that's great, but maybe we'll introduce you to some additional um, services that uh, you might not be aware of. So we're really excited about that, and we're hoping to have lots of time uh, to chat with you and answer any questions you might have. Uh, next slide, please. So very briefly, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that many of you may not be familiar with IMLS. We are uh, what we like to say a small, and mighty federal agency, but uh, we have an annual budget of uh, just $230 million, and there's about 50 of us who work here. 
uh, but we are a federal agency funded through congressional appropriations. Our director and board um, are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, and we have been in existence for 20 years this year. So, um, and we like to think we're one of the, the you know, coolest federal agencies that maybe you've never heard of. Um, next slide, please. So um, we exist to support museums and libraries in advancing innovation, lifelong learning, and cultural and civic engagement around the country. And um, we think that libraries and museums um, are, in fact, really uniquely positioned um, uh, within sort of the, the ecosystem of a community to provide um, opportunities for citizens and, and residents that, uh, that um, other organizations are differently positioned to address. So we, we think that uh, we are a very important piece of the puzzle in our communities that we're serving. Uh, next slide. Our primary activities at IMLS are around grant making, uh, but we also do policy and convening. Uh, we host national strategic initiatives, and we have a research and statistics arm. Next slide. Our grant making is driven by three, uh, three primary strategic goals. And I think you'll agree, as you hear Chris and Becky talk a bit later, uh, that, that um, these, these goals are quite evident in the work, evident in the work that libraries are doing um, every day in their communities. So we're really interested in supporting um, opportunities uh, and lifelong learning experiences that place the learner at the center of the experience that are driven by personal interest and are participatory in nature. Uh, we think it's really important that museums and libraries think of themselves as critical community anchor institutions and again enhance uh, cultural and civic engagement and improve the economic vitality of the communities they serve. And that they uh, provide exemplary stewardship uh, of the collections that they host to facilitate knowledge and uh, uh, preserve cultural heritage. And when we talk about collections in this case, that could be, um, you know, I think traditionally people think about library collections in terms of books, but that could also be uh, access to uh, technology and tools. And I think that uh, we'll be highlighting some of those examples a little bit later on. But we're not just thinking about um, you know, books on a shelf, necessarily. Uh, next slide, please. So we are, um, I'm thrilled to, to be on this webinar with you today because actually just a week ago, IMLS announced a new initiative that is emphasizing the role of museums and libraries as community catalysts. We've got a, a partnership with the Reinvestment Fund and support from um, the William Penn Foundation, so this is a, a great private partner, uh, private public partnership. And we're really interested in thinking about how museums and libraries can uh, better serve that role as community anchors and, and what kind of tools and professional development might be necessary to help them really take that work to the next level. We know that uh, libraries can contribute significantly to issues like quality of life and education economic renewal and community cohesion, and we're really hoping to leverage that great work and, and really sort of um, help propel it to the next level. I think you'll also hear later from Becky um, some other work happening in the library community uh, from the American Library Association around the Libraries Transform Initiative. Next slide. So what do museums and libraries have to offer uh, communities, and more specifically, what might they have to offer your residents and, and the communities that you're serving uh, that's unique from maybe schools or other um, uh, informal learning or lifelong learning providers? So um, the, the three things that come to my mind immediately are that we have rich and authentic content. Uh, and again, that could be books, that could be access to technology, it could be uh, uh, access to uh, to tools. Uh, we have staff that are dedicated and, uh, and truly care about helping people uh, leverage library resources to make uh, decisions that will improve their lives. And we have safe, trusted settings. Um, 
And other than, than public schools, there are very few institutions uh, that, that exist in most every community across the country. And, and you know, public libraries are available in most every city and county and town uh, across the country. And they're great places to promote 21st century learning skills that are so important for uh, participation in, in, uh, in society and in our increasingly uh, global workforce skills like critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. Next slide, please. There are many types of lifelong learning opportunities uh, in libraries. Uh, and again, some of these might be ones that you're thinking about, um, but if you haven't visited a library um, in quite some time, you might be surprised uh, some of the new uh, takes on things that we are doing and, and some of the new types of services that, we are, um, that we're embarking on. So certainly, um, you know, we all remember story times probably from when we um, were young, but I'd say that libraries are doing really incredible early learning programs today that go far beyond what you might remember uh, from your own childhood or from when um, your children were young. Uh, our approach to summer is, is rapidly um, evolving. We've gone from thinking about summer reading programs to thinking about summer learning more broadly and increasingly in many communities summer nutrition programs as well uh, for, for students that get um, free and reduced uh, uh, lunches during the school year. Uh, in the summertime, many public libraries are taking on the role of uh, facilitating um, uh, summer meal programs. Um, for teens and tweens, there's after-school programs ranging from homework help to more self-directed learning opportunities. And for adults, um, we're, we're seeing a lot more emphasis placed on job training and um, uh, remedial education for new Americans specifically a lot around citizenship and English language acquisition um, so there's a whole host of really uh, incredible uh, learning opportunities available in your public library and again you're going to hear from Chris and, and Becky very shortly what that's looking like in Cuyahoga County and in Philadelphia but I think um, as you think about these different services, next slide please, um, I hope what you're perhaps picking up on is that there has been a real shift in, uh, in public library practice over the last uh, decade or so that I would say, and these are two quotes that um, are often really inspiring to me when I think about uh, the work of the library today and sort of how we've evolved. If you haven't been to a library in a really long time. Um, you might have this notion of a library as a dusty place, um, you know, again, full of books. And certainly books are very important and, um, and you know, are, aren't going anywhere. But there's also increased emphasis on uh, digital services and on other sorts of programming. And we're really less shh, don't touch today and a lot more hands on, minds on. Uh, and again, I love this quote from Joyce Valenza, the notion of the library as a grocery store, a place where you go and take things off the shelf and make something, uh, excuse me, um, as, a, as a kitchen where you're, where you're making something rather than just as a grocery store where you're going and taking something off the shelf and, and that's it, that there's a lot, it's not just a transaction, that there is uh, activity uh, and, and uh, hopefully exchange happening there. So um, next slide, please. So one of the things we wanted to do really briefly is just uh, introduce you quickly to a few of the, the principles that are guiding uh, uh, some of these new exciting library programs that, that uh, we're talking about today. Um, and again, Becky and Chris are going to go so much deeper into these, but we wanted to make sure you had a good sense of sort of what those um, overarching principles or frameworks are that are informing our practice today. So certainly, um, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math um, is an incredibly important uh, 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 strand in our society today. We know that, that uh, children need to uh, have STEM education if they're hoping to be competitive in this, this global workforce. And we think that libraries are really great places for STEM education opportunities to take place. And while librarians themselves are not often STEM experts, uh, they can be incredibly successful as facilitators of STEM learning experiences and as platforms for, for STEM education and partnerships with other organizations. Um, 
and again, that, that notion of uh, being able to work uh, across the lifespan, you know, from 1 to 92, uh, is, I think, incredibly important. Next slide, please. A lot of our services for teens and tweens right now are informed by some really exciting research happening uh, by a, a, a professor named Mimi Ito at UC Irvine around this concept called connected learning. And the idea here uh, is that teens learn best in networks and in environments that are driven by their interests, that are supported by peers and near peers. Um, and support academic pursuits while still sort of being interest driven. Um, and that these spaces should have uh, these spaces within libraries and museums and other contexts uh, to, to serve teams uh, could be designed in such a way that they would demonstrate shared purpose, that they would be focused on the production of media and tools and uh, 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 that, that are meaningful to the team's lives and that they're openly networked. So it's not just a single place, but that there's more a uh, distribution across the community that we're really thinking about uh, collective impact models. And uh, one specific example of that, next slide please, that uh, may be popping up in your communities or maybe that, that you've heard of, is uh, the maker movement. And we are really excited about uh, making and learning in libraries. I think. Yeah, you know, hearkening back to that Joyce Valenza quote about the library as a kitchen instead of a grocery store, I think the maker spaces are a great example of what that can look like. So these are places for hands-on, self-directed, do-it-yourself learning, where people are gathering to invent, create, and learn. And they could include digital tools like 3D printers and laser printers, but there could also be traditional tools like sewing machines and carpentry and simple electronics to really give people um, a chance to have hands-on experience. And sometimes that can be to promote uh, personal interest, but other times that can be related to, uh, to uh, pursuit of uh, employment and job skills. Next slide. Uh, really quickly, we wanted to make sure we mentioned coding. The libraries have long been involved in digital literacy and information literacy and uh, you know, considering the important role of digital inclusion and how libraries can help bridge that digital divide between um, citizens and, and residents that have access to high-speed internet at home and those that only are able to access it in libraries and schools and other public spaces. Um, so, and when we think about digital literacy today, you know, uh, for, for quite some time that meant uh, basic computing often. Um, but we've moved far beyond that also. A lot of libraries now are offering opportunities for uh, patrons to learn coding or video game design or robotics. And we think it's really important that these things happen in libraries because uh, we know that so often the STEM fields are dominated by, um, um, uh, you know, they, they aren't the most inclusive professions. And we think that uh, by situating some of these opportunities within libraries, we're more likely to be able to attract women and minorities and people with less financial means to uh, get a taste of these opportunities and build these skills in themselves. Um, and really quickly, the last thing I want to touch on is the important role, next slide please, of, of early learning. And one thing that uh, a lot of libraries are doing around the country is participating in local implementations of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. This is a national campaign. It's in over 250 communities now, which is incredible. Um, and it's focused on getting children to read at grade level by the time they, they uh, complete the third grade. Libraries are often taking a role at the local level um, in, in supporting these efforts in partnership with many other um, organizations like schools and Head Starts and et cetera, et cetera, um, clinics and, and others. And um, the, the pillars of the, uh, of the campaign really focus on making sure that all children are, are ready for kindergarten, um, that, that we are working to battle chronic absenteeism, that uh, we recognize the huge uh, importance of learning during the summer, that there is tremendous uh, detriment to students who have summer slides, 
and that we need to, importantly, be engaging parents and caregivers as their children's first teachers. And again, I think you're going to hear from these examples from Chris and from Becky how beautifully situated libraries are, what exciting work is happening in our communities to um, help um, help uh, children and families and people across the lifespan to um, to participate and, and learn um, and better themselves through that learning. So with that, I am delighted to pass things to Chris Caputo at the Free Library of Philadelphia to tell you more of the exciting work that they're doing. Thanks, Tim. I'm so happy to be with you today. I'm Christine Caputo. I'm Chief of the Public Service Support Division at the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'd like to just start by giving you a little background about our library system. Uh, we are the public library system for the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We have 54 libraries across the city in every neighborhood with a total of 61 locations for library services, which include our hotspots and Technobile, which um, provide additional services in neighborhoods where there aren't libraries. Our mission is to advance literacy, guide learning, and inspire curiosity. And as Tim mentioned, we work uh, with all ages, providing a full range of services and programs um, from people from birth to, to all the way through older adults, um, focusing on things like adult literacy and English language uh, lessons, but also after school programs and summer programs for children and teens. We have um, educational programs with authors. We have a um, culinary literacy program on cooking and learning uh, print literacy and math through cooking. We have a maker program where people are creating all kinds of wonderful things. And we have much, much more happening at all of our locations. Um, today I want to share with you a little bit about some of the activities that we're um, doing that in collaboration with our local house, uh, public housing, the Philadelphia Housing Authority, as well as some of our STEM and STEAM activities. Uh, because we're a library, we like to be inclusive. We have STEM activities and we've added arts in to make it STEAM. Uh, so on the next slide, I'd like to start with our Words at Play Vocabulary Initiative, uh, which is for our youngest children, focused on families with children from birth to five years. This is a grant-funded program supported by PNC Grow Up Great. And I will say almost all of the programs that we do have private support and without all of our funders, including the Institute of Museum and Library Services, we could not manage all of the great work that we're doing. This is a collective impact model in one of our um, lowest income communities uh, where we have five cultural organizations, the library, the Franklin Institute Science Museum, the Kimmel Center of Performing Arts, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Philadelphia Zoo, all working together to provide activities and experiences for the families in the neighborhood, as well as bringing them out from the neighborhood to the cultural institutions. Um, you may have heard of the 30 million word gap previously, and this initiative was designed to help support families um, whose children may not have heard a lot of words. The 30 million word gap really um, was a research study that showed that, that uh, children in uh, high poverty communities don't have have not heard as many words as children in upper income communities and that that it has a bad effect on their school readiness and that they don't have as much language um, and so their reading is delayed when they start school. So this initiative takes fun play programs where we bring arts and science out to the community. Um, in the photos you can see on the far right we have um, April there who's got a gumdrop structure on her head. She's just being silly. But this was a STEM activity with our partner at the Franklin Institute where we based this activity on a book about building called Dreaming Up. We had the kids, um, they had um, uh, wooden rods, gumdrops, and then they built triangles and put them together to create structures. So it was a very introductory way to understand how to build stable buildings. And um, so it was a, a, just a quick activity. Um, some other STEM activities that we've done in there is using um, plastic building materials so that kids and families can work together while they're learning those um, science principles. They're also talking together, which is helping to increase vocabulary when you talk about stability or you talk about adding a layer onto the top of that layer. All of that is very helpful in building the vocabulary of the children. And what this initiative also does is it doesn't just expose children to words, it gives them the concepts and the experiences behind those words. What we often hear from our school district staff is that um, children can read the words. They've taught, been taught very well how to read words. They just don't understand what they're learning. They don't have the comprehension of what they're reading because they don't understand the concepts behind that. And this very fun program helps build that. 
Um, some of the really big successes we've had here is we've worked with neighborhood residents to hire them as our neighborhood ambassadors to go out into the community and um, let people know about the program to help us build trust between the partner organizations and the community residents so that they're excited to come and participate as well as um, feeling that this is a program for them and it's a safe environment. Um, we've also collaborated with uh, small businesses and other organizations in the community. And the photo on the left side of the slide, that's in one of our neighborhood barber shops. Um, and that's Jazz, who's taking time off from trimming people's hair and giving them a stylish look to um, participate. And he took one of our book nooks into his center, and he's reading to a group of students from the child care center that's next door to his barber shop. Um, what he's told us over time is that the people who come into his shop, while the kids are waiting for their own haircuts, or for their parents to get their hair done. Um, they're sitting and reading. Um, grandparents and parents are reading with their children. And so it's just been a really positive experience to bring literacy and learning out into what might, some people might consider non-traditional locations. Um, I would also want, want to just add that this was a collaboration to bring STEM to the um, one of our housing sites, uh, public housing sites, where we brought a four-part programming series um, into the into the community room of the housing site so that residents did not have to travel far distances to access this program and service, but it was right there in the community room, and it also enabled nearby residents um, who are not in the housing site to also participate. And one of our um, neighborhood ambassadors, Alfonso, was at, actually associated with the Raymond Rosing Housing Development and was uh, done a great job in really building that relationship between the library, the cultural partners that we have, and the uh, housing uh, authority. So so um, that's just one of our programs for the youngest children. I'd like to continue on the next slide by talking a little bit more about our Stories Alive program. Um, this is um, a program that connects incarcerated parents uh, with their children through reading and televisiting. Um, what we've done in a few of our libraries is set up um, a computer, so um, working with the Philadelphia prison um, system to um, have selected incarcerated parents get a, a book um, that they can read to their child um, via teleconferencing. The child has the same book while they're in the library. And it is, um, was designed to be a family literacy experience so that the, um, and to create family bonding so that while the, the adult um, is incarcerated, they're not losing touch with their child. It's been really successful, and families have great, been greatly appreciative because it's happening in their communities. But the other byproduct of this in sort of a stem way is this is the first time that many of our families have participated in video conferencing. And so um, that's been a great experience for them, as well as being able to talk to and read with um, the adult that's uh, um, in the prison. Uh, the other piece of this that happens is just that we have a, a reentry guide for both the families and the returning citizen uh, to help them know what library services are available to them as well as other services through the, through the city system. Moving on to another program. I'm sorry, I'm talking really fast, but I'm just going to whiz through all of these things and we'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Um, the next slide really focuses on summer. As Tim talked about, um, the campaign for grade level reading um, has summer uh, learning loss as one of their pillars to try and work against. And at the Free Library of Philadelphia, we are actually the lead agency, the backbone agency for our citywide campaign for grade level reading, which we call Read by Fourth. Um, this summer, we're working with about 125 summer camps to train all of the employees on how to uh, support children's literacy and learning. We've given all of the sites um, a read aloud collection with um, activities that go along with that, which are literacy based and STEAM based. And we also give an independent reading library so the, the early, the youngest children who are learning how to read, um, the kindergarten to third graders can practice their reading while they're in summer camp this year. And 14 of our housing authority sites are, are participating in this program. Um, as Tim mentioned, you've probably, maybe yourself, participated in a summer reading program over, over the years. Um, but libraries are really um, growing and extending our, our learning and our, our services. Um, on the far right side of the photo of children in our Science in the Summer program, sponsored by GSK, um, we have microscopes there. These are second and third graders, and they're learning about biology is our theme this year. They are looking at bacteria on slides under the microscopes. They're drawing what they're seeing. They're also discussing what bacteria is and other single-celled organisms. They're looking at how bacteria grows, what causes it to grow. 
And it's really helpful to help encourage them to keep washing their hands to get rid of that bacteria. So it's a, a one-week program that has been really exciting for the kids to participate in. And each summer they can come back and participate again because the theme changes each year. So that next year we'll be focusing on chemistry. And then the year after that we'll be looking at physics, talking about simple machines. So each year it builds upon their, their basic science knowledge. We also do some other science programs in the summer, uh, which include another partnership with our Franklin Institute Science Museum on Leap into Science, where we've actually trained our librarians to bring science to the community by um, giving them curriculum and the materials to do experiments with wind, to do experiments um, with sound, um, to do experiments with balance and simple machines. And so it really helps for our younger patrons to help uh, ground them in basic science facts and let them have chances to do hands-on activities that are really experiential and allow them to, to have a little bit of a trial and error to try things and see why did that work, why did that not work, and then to expand from there. The next slide I want to talk a little bit more about um, another program we have that happens year-round, but especially in the summer, is our Maker program, where, um, which we call in Philadelphia Maker John. Um, it provides a unique space for community members of all ages to come together um, to experience self-directed, experimental, and experiential learning, um, which has a focus on creativity, critical thinking, and skill building. But it also really is about learning to fail forward. Um, a lot of times in school, um, kids often have to learn something and then repeat it for a test. Um, and they don't get to try it and see how it works for themselves. And the Maker program really engages kids um, using connected learning to build on what they already love. Um, on the picture on the lower right corner, you can see that we have two students there who are doing video game uh, design, and they're very focused, they're very engaged with that, very excited about that. Um, we also do things with green screen um, stop motion animation so that um, students um, can really take the time to explore and figure out how they want to communicate and what they want to say um, so that they're really um, building upon their interests and their skills. Um, this program also is partnering with our culinary literacy program. So we have some gardens growing in the back of some of our libraries. And um, the kids are then taking the vegetables that they're growing. And then they're learning uh, kitchen skills, cutting and, and uh, chopping and uh, cooking, so that then they can learn to eat the food that they're growing. And then um, just to, no to note that our maker programs are really focused on STEAM. They're really um, focused on that science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics um, to create and share artifacts that reflect their identities and their communities. Um, and through the uh, act of making, participants of all ages will have the opportunity to design meaningful digital and physical objects that capture the riches and diversity of their neighborhoods and that really represent themselves. Um, this program is really fun and exciting and it's intergenerational. So we, have, uh, we started with teenagers, but then we built up and we added on um, adults and younger students as well to participate all together as a family and a community. Next up, we have our Get Hype. Philly program. This is another collective impact program where we um, are partnering with 10 other organizations led by the Food Trust in Philadelphia to help focus on healthy living for teenagers. Um, the Free Library's contribu uh, contribution to this is our focus on culinary literacy. And you can see in the photos that we have a, a variety of different kinds of cooking activities happen. And yes, we do give knives to teenagers and they are excellent at learning how to chop apples and vegetables and all kinds of things. Um, one of the partnerships we have is with the School District of Philadelphia where we were able to um, have a contest. And so teenagers were learning to cook. They developed their own recipe. And the winner of that contest, their recipe was then um, incorporated into the school lunch program so that um, students could have something new added to their lunch. Um, this is really a great STEM program because it not only helps them with something practical like cooking something healthy for a snack or for dinner, but it also helps them with mathematical skills. Uh, all of you who cook know, you know, if you have a recipe for um, four people and you've got six people in your family, you've got to use all those fractions to figure that out. In addition to using measuring cups and measuring spoons and um, balancing on dividing up the food. Um, so it really incorporates um, a lot of different kinds of literacies into a really fun activity because with teenagers, whenever you have food, you know they will be there to show up. 
I just wanted to mention also that at the bottom of the uh, slide, there's a photo of two of our outreach culinary literacy specialists, Kira and Stefan, who are working with a, gla uh, a group of, of teenagers in our culinary literacy center. That's our demonstration kitchen that we have at the Parkway Central Library, where we do all kinds of cooking uh, activities and culinary literacy activities for all ages. Moving on to our next activity, um, I literally wanted to just talk about some services and programs we have for adults. Um, we have a, uh, another collective impact program that is transforming our library services to our job seekers, which is also made possible by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, this particular neighborhood we're focusing in um, was really selected because it has a very high unemployment rate and a very high poverty rate. It also has a community that is, um, has many uh, residents from immigrant and refugee communities and a large population of formerly incarcerated residents. And so the, the employment situation there is a little bleak for them. We have 10 organizations who have partnered together to do job training for um, individuals, to do coaching, to do basic literacy and GED prep. Um, we're also working with them to provide um, hands-on activities at the library so they can learn um, skills. And in, in this picture, you can just see that um, we have a Thai library, which we affectionately call the thai library, where you can use your library card to check out a Thai so that you too can go to your job interview with a spiffy new Thai. Um, and we have quite a selection there, you can see from the photos. Um, this uh, really uh, struck the uh, funny bone of a lot of our local reporters who have been out to visit and see which Thai that looks best on them. But in all seriousness, this has really been a boon to the community and has been very popular. And it's been sometimes hard to keep enough Thais in to meet the demand. I just also want to mention about this project that um, because there's so many partners in that uh, collective impact model where we're all working together to reach the same goals, it really has been successful because it imposed a great degree of discipline on all of the partners during the planning process, which forced us to really think through what we wanted to do collectively um, so that we could um, resolve all of our issues and really have a, a solid plan going forward. Um, and the library is the backbone institution and the lead organization for this, and our housing authority is also uh, one of the partners on the project serving on the advisory uh, committee. And then on the last slide, um, I just wanted to talk just for a second about our digital literacy. As Tim mentioned, we have a host of different kinds of cutting edge technologies that we work with. This one is um, our hotspots and neighborhoods where we have a low technical literacy rate and um, we have our tech mobile in the photo there that goes out to communities including our housing sites to um, bring activities um, to the community, both um, things like using green screens to create films, but also signing up for um, online jobs, um, writing a resume, doing job searches, um, and we even have a hotspot at our Philadelphia International Airport, so if you're ever visiting Philadelphia, feel free to stop by and use our free Wi-Fi there. So now I will turn it over to Rebecca Ranallo um, from Cuyahoga to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, their activities. Wonderful. Thanks, Chris. Um, you're a hard act to follow. Uh, <laughs> Laura, you can go to the next slide. Um, like Chris said, my name is Rebecca Ranallo. I'm the Information and Technology Literacy Manager at Cuyahoga County Public Library. Um, the quick explanation of that is that I manage technology programming for the system. So that's everything from helping our staff get comfortable with using iPads and story times um, to teaching digital literacy to seniors and everything in between. Um, a quick note about who we are. We are uh, in Cuyahoga County, which is the county that Cleveland is located in. So there are an awful lot of Republicans here with us right now. Um, we actually, uh, there are nine library systems in Cuyahoga County, uh, including our system, which has 27 branches, and uh, Cleveland Public Library, which serves the actual city of Cleveland. Um, so we serve 47 of the communities that ring the city of Cleveland. Uh, we consistently rank among the busiest and best systems in the country, um, and we serve everything from our inner ring suburbs, which mirror the, the city's uh, high levels of poverty, uh, to some of the wealthiest communities in the county. So we have a, a, a deep breadth of services and uh, needs in our communities. Um, we are always balancing who we are as a system with the individual needs of those communities. So that means we're allowing for things like uh, services tailored to community needs. Uh, some of the things that you heard Chris talk about 
already, like grade level reading programs in communities that show a real need for children who aren't going to meet the third grade reading guarantee, or summer lunch programs. We're actually serving lunch in uh, 14 locations this summer, and in the fall we'll start actually serving dinner in three of our locations uh, because it's become really apparent that in those locations um, it's very possible that our kids aren't going home from school and getting a meal. And so uh, we're partnering with our local food bank to do some, uh, to meet some of that need. Um, it also means though that uh, as a large system we want to make sure that we're offering the same level of access and resources to all of our communities. So um, even our communities of need all of our branches uh, have been, except two, and those two are on the way, have been touched in some way with a renovation project. So they've either been built new or renovated within the last uh, four years. Um, and that means that they all have things like computer labs and high-speed computer access and Wi-Fi um, and lots of plugs for, for laptops um, and really have uh, vibrant play, learn, and grow areas for children. Um, we really wanted to make sure that there was equal access across all of our communities. So not only are we in a position to tailor some of our services to those communities, but we're also um, making sure that everybody has a base level of incredible access to uh, technology and to resources. Um, we as a system are always moving forward and growing. Um, next slide, please. So for the last uh, year, our executive director, Sari Feldman, has been the president of the American Library Association. Um, and in that role, she's presided over ALA's uh, launched Libraries Transform campaign. And Tim touched on this piece, uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about it because it really is, and I, I'm going to talk less about what what we do and who we are because I think that Chris has already shown a great example of how much libraries do um, and I'll have a little bit more to add to that um, and Tim definitely hit on a lot of those principles but libraries feel different now than they used to. Um, gone are those days when you're shushed for talking in the library. Uh, libraries are much more about what we what we do for and with people than what we have for people. They still come to us for books and DVDs and databases and resources, but the reality is that they're utilizing us much more um, for our services, for what we can provide to them, for what they can learn for and with us, from and with us. Um, and they really are now places that encourage collaboration and communication. Um, you can move to the next slide. I, it, because of that, libraries are vibrant. Um, I think it, it maybe throws people off sometimes that, that they're not quiet spaces, but um, they are, you can see people engaging and talking. You can see kids, this is a shot of kids gaming in our Warrensville location. Um, it looks this way every single afternoon. That space is full of children and they are, they are all uh, working with each other and playing a game and doing something. Um, they're engaged, I think is what I want to say here. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't uh, still offer all of those resources for them. You can see kids in the background working on some of our computers. Um, but the reality is that they're, they're coming for the community in a lot of cases. Uh, you can keep going through the next three shots of pictures. So, we're social places now. It's about the meeting rooms, it's about um, the, the programs that we offer, it's about the classes that we offer. Uh, and you can keep going, Laura, um, through the next couple of pictures too as I'm talking. Um, we are those places where people come to learn from us. Uh, we still offer computer access, high-speed connectivity, community meeting spaces, technology training, um, including basic digital literacy services. We offer workforce training, homework centers, grade level reading programs, college readiness programs, GED and ABLE. All of those things have been library services for a long time. But in a lot of cases now, um, it is really the backbone of what we do. It's not just a partner who comes in, but it is who we are and who we are in our community and we are the people who provide it. Um, I think the same fits really well, and I think this fits really well with the Energy Everywhere theme of this webinar, because libraries are full of energy now. 
Um, it is rare to come into one of our branches and not see something exciting going on. Um, and, and along those lines, uh, STEM and STEAM learning is, is one of those exciting things that we do. Um, we offer all of our branch librarians, all of our youth branch librarians are trained in LEGO robotics. And uh, I think robotics is a perfect example of a, a great STEM program. It is basic coding, it is problem solving, and it is engineering all pulled into a really great curriculum. Um, and ours, most of our challenges and uh, programs that we do are book-based because we are a library after all. Um, but it is all of those things, and we like to say often that we're hiding the vegetables in our programs. So the kids are getting coding and engineering and teamwork and problem solving and things that we don't have to force them to do because they're really excited to do it and to work with what they don't know is a curriculum. They just think it's a fun program. Um, next slide, please, Laura. So as I mentioned, um, all of our librarians are trained in a LEGO robotics curriculum and they facilitate these programs. Um, we do it at every branch. We can do a one afternoon program. We can do a, uh, the, right now, um, 10 of them are offering summer four day camps in robotics. Um, and we're revamping those curriculums as we go. So last week there was a Minecraft camp and um, this week there's a, a divergence camp with, a, with our robots. Um, and I think there's actually a zombie one and a, uh, oh, what was the other one coming up? Oh, there's a Walking Dead one coming up too. It's actually based on the TV show, and that one we're even um, converting into an adult curriculum. Um, it's not just teens who like robots. Uh, next slide. These all also lend themselves really well. Uh, these are actually shots of a robotics tournament we did this summer. Um, and we actually are in the process of working with our local NASA group to do three tournaments this summer um, where they're doing uh, sumo bot wrestling <laughs> with their robots. Um, it's really fun and pretty much all we have to say is NASA and our, our programs are full. Um, but these lend themselves really well to in-branch, to big events, but they also lend themselves really well to outreach. And that was why I wanted to talk about this here too. All the programs that I hit on um, are going to be things that we do in our branches, but that also could work really well as outreach, um, say to the communities around us or a community center. Um, we've taken them to schools. We take them to the housing developments in the area. Um, they all can be things that, um, that can be done in our facilities or outside of our facilities. Uh, next slide, Laura. And you can go to the next one. So the other piece that I think fits really well here is connected learning. And you've heard both Tim and Chris mention this. Um, the connected learning is, is for teens. It is interest-driven, peer-supported, and academically oriented. Um, and for us, it's something that we thought fit really well with teen programming. It was a change that we made last year where all of our teen programming moved to connected learning. Um, and what we love about it is that it gives us a way, again, to hide those vegetables for our kids, to make it a STEM program. Um, and to work with our schools, uh, we work, we have 22 different school districts throughout our 47 communities. Um, some of them we work very closely with, some of them we're still working on it. Um, but those school districts, we've heard unanimously, are struggling to, um, to do things that are out of school time programs or to, do, to meet all of those needs that they have when they're teaching to the test. And so our role is to provide those out of school time programs, to provide more art programs, to provide those coding programs where we can, um, and to provide that kind of additional boost to the programs that our, our schools are, are offering to our kids. Um, you can keep going, Laura, next slide. So connected learning provides a great opportunity to do this. We can get the kids into small social groups. We can have them work together. Um, usually it's something like we're going to pull out the iPads today and have you work on um, a stop anima animation video um, and you're going to get in small groups and create something. And then resources and to learn from each other and create a good community. Um, next slide. And I will go fast because I know we're hitting our time. And the next slide too, please. So this is a great way to engage kids. Um, and the reason I really wanted to talk about it was because it also lends itself very well to outreach. 
it's not just about um, something that we can do in our branches, but because we utilize iPad labs a lot, or laptops in some cases, they can also be taken outside. So whether it's done with the schools, um, I have one staff person who goes to the schools every month, or it's done with the local um, community center or housing project, um, they're definitely something that could be done in our branches or outside too. Um, keep going, please, Laura. And next one. And the next one. These are all kids having fun. I figure you can never go wrong with pictures of kids and technology. Perfect. Um, so finally, I want to close here with um, all of those opportunities that we have for adults. Uh, much like the pieces that Chris touched on, uh, we have a lot of job training services and technology training. Uh, this is one of our computer labs. It is full every single day, no matter what time you are there. Um, we also have a, a career center. Uh, it, this is unusual among libraries, but we have had a career center in place for 40 years at Cuyahoga County Public Library. They actually do uh, career training, they do job clubs, they do sessions on soft skills, uh, they go out to the majority of our branches and run these sessions, as well as their two uh, fixed locations. Um, and they also have strong ties to the community to boost our services uh, to anyone in the community who needs help with a, a job search or just needs to run through an interview or have their resume looked over. Um, we do technology training from digital literacy classes through advanced design software. Uh, we partner with our local groups to do GED, ESOL, and ABLE programs. Um, and those same groups are helping us run a college readiness program for customers who maybe want to go back to community college but aren't quite ready or are concerned about their skill level and, and going back. Um, and finally, I, I really want to stress that libraries are for family learning. Um, you can go to the next slide, too. Libraries are for family learning. And so when adults are here for our technology programs or are here for, um, for GED or ABLE, um, we have a homework center in 14 of our locations. We have Play, Learn, and Grow children spaces that are all about kids learning. Um, and much like our technology programs, it's not always apparent to the kids that they're learning. They're just having fun. Um, but they're designed to engage and enrich kids. And like Tim said, we're safe spaces. In many of our communities, we are the space that kids go after school um, or that parents can bring their kids and know that they're safe. Uh, and so a lot of these, are, I feel like, are traditional library services, but we really are growing and changing who we are, and I feel like even uh, becoming more ingrained in, in our communities. And so uh, if you haven't reached out to your local libraries, I, I would really suggest that you do, because uh, you've heard from two uh, large, very engaged libraries today, but um, it's happening all over the country in, in lots of communities. That's, that's it for me. Becky, thank you for that, and thank you, Chris. I feel so uh, energized by by your presentations and by the great work happening in your library systems. And I'm sure that our our listeners today hopefully um, you know uh, learn some new things about what libraries are doing or have some new ideas of uh, programs that they might like to connect their uh, their residents to in their own communities. So um, that's really terrific. Um, you know, in my, we'd love to take questions from you in the chat box in the last few minutes that we have. Um, while we're waiting for folks to, to do that, I'm just wondering, would you have any recommendations maybe uh, for someone listening today who is looking to maybe start a partnership with their local library or sort of explore in their community exactly what kinds of programs or services might be available? How would you suggest uh, they might reach out, and who should they look to talk to? Um, this is Rebecca, and I would say um, check with your, you probably have a local branch that's that's nearby or a local, and so check with that branch manager, or if it's a single system, check with um, the, the head of the system, possibly, um, or even, you know, in most cases, we have librarians who are already doing outreach to locations. So even if we're looking to promote another program uh, with uh, one of our staff. And so however you make an inroad, our staff are really good at, at using their resources and finding the right person. 
I would just add on to that that um, we, we get a lot of requests through our website, so if, you, if all else fails and you can't find anyone to talk to, please feel free to use the um, email uh, link on the, any library's website to just send a generic question in and, and they'll direct it to the right person to touch base with you. Great. And if anyone has any questions who's listening, and please feel free to, to check in the chat box. I realize that um, we threw an awful lot at you in a really short period of time, but hopefully, um, you know, as I said before, it was uh, you received it uh, with enthusiasm and with the passion that it was offered because, uh, you know, um, I know that both Cuyahoga County and Philadelphia are doing just really, really tremendous work in their communities. and. Um, you know, my last slide, my question slide, had a, a quote from Andrew Carnegie that I just really love as a former Pittsburgher and as someone working with libraries. A library outranks any other one thing a community can do to benefit its people. And, and that's something I think that all of us at IMLS and certainly our partners uh, around the country really believe. So, you know, please know that we're a resource that's available to you. Um, and, and uh, you know, leverage, you know, take advantage of all the, the um, programs and services and resources we have available um, for, uh, for your use and uh, that you can point your residents towards. Heidi, since we don't have any questions coming through, do you have any final words for us? No, I was just typing, uh, thank you so much for the presentation and the enthusiasm <laughs> with which it was delivered. Uh, it really was an inspiration. So uh, another in our series of uh, looking for STEM learning opportunities where residents live. So thank you again. That was great. Uh, and Miranda, I think, is going to tell us how to join next month's webinar. Okay, hey everyone. So uh, thanks again to the presenters and for everyone viewing the webinar. Uh, we hope you will be able to join us next month as we explore code.org's free computer science resources. Okay. Thanks for now and see you then.